Welcome to Was Gandhi Racist? An Academy for Teachers Masterclass with Shobana Shankar. I'm Lindsay Rossler. I've been teaching social studies for 15 years, the last three at the King School in Stamford, Connecticut. I'm a proud fellow of the Academy for Teachers, where teachers learn from scholars as well as from brilliant fellow educators. The Academy offers a space where teachers are respected and more than ever, their programs feel like a form of self-care. I have the honor of introducing Shobana Shankar. Shobana is a sociocultural historian of West Africa and the Global South at Stony Brook University. She was also a teacher in the New York City public school system. I love what I do because I spend my days helping students explore history by asking the question, how should we treat one another? which makes this masterclass of particular interest. Was Gandhi a racist? A jarring question. I have largely taught Gandhi's time in South Africa as his awakening to anti-colonialism, anti-racism, and satyagraha as a strategy for activism. It's time to complicate the narrative and help students see Gandhi and the complexity of the African-Indian relationship. But Shobana is not the only star of this masterclass. It is also my honor to introduce the 19 teachers here today who were selected from many applicants. This is an impressive group with advanced degrees in history, education, law, urban affairs, political science, liberal arts, um, urban education policy. They teach grades four through 12 at early college and public schools, charter schools, and independent schools. We teach some really interesting subjects like race and identity and cultural anthropology and the number of extracurriculars we coach or advise blows my mind. Everything from history by design to the Harry Potter book and movie club to lacrosse. There's a lot of teaching experience here today. We've been in the classroom between one and 26 years and the total number of years we've been teaching is 284. We teach between 13 and 150 kids, and the number of children who know our names is 1,488, and that's just this year. So your real audience today, Shobana, are those 1,488 kids, because every single one of us here in some way will share with them what we learn from you. The ripple effect of a masterclass is huge. So thank you, Dr. Shankar, for being here. It feels more urgent now than ever to say with heartfelt gratitude, thank you to my fellow educators for teaching. And with that, let the masterclass begin. Shobana, take it away. Thank you for that amazing um, introduction beginning. Um, I'm very honored to be here. Uh, I, I do wanna thank you all for doing what you do. Um, and also to say that um, I'm really happy to be in this community. Um, so there are so many urgent questions, I think, in the um, topic that we'll be discussing today. Um, African, Indian, African, Asian race relations. Um, and so, what, uh, just to reiterate, I am going to share my PowerPoint, but please do use the chat. And if you do have a question in, in while I'm presenting, please ask it. Um, but at the end, I also hope to leave time so for us to have a, a, have a robust discussion. So I'm going to share my um, screen now. It looks like my PowerPoint is not coming up. Um, and what I first did, let's see. What I first did in my in putting together my PowerPoint for today um, is to just take from your amazing statements um, that you wrote to join this uh, masterclass. Um, let me minimize this. Um, some of the st just phrases from your from your from your statements because I think there's so much in what you said which is what I would like to say today. So um, some of the phrases here, uh, caste, the American caste system, model minority myth, um, how do we do anti-racist work, student-led discussions, nonviolence, what is the opposite of that, bullying. Um, there's so much in these uh, phrases. Um, so I hope that um, I can put this slide back up at the end of the 
presentation as well. Uh, but I think that um, the, to the, to the time is now to be discussing um, was Gandhi racist and the other unsettling questions that come up from this history. So um, I will start uh, by um, beginning um, in 2018 with uh, this picture you see here in this episode that you read about or a several year episode that you read about um, that began in 2016 in Ghana um, when the Indian government gave, presented a statue to the University of, Lake, of Ghana at Lagon um, of Gandhi. And um, immediately a movement arose called hashtag Gandhi must fall. Uh, modeled on the um, the uh, roads must fall movement, which had emerged in South Africa around uh, the around Cecil Rhodes, uh, but also the fees must fall movement. And um, so, I'm oh, sorry, I'm going to open my chat so I can also see. Oh, you still also see? You only see that? Okay, let's see. Sometimes I have this problem that advancing the slide. Um, slideshow okay oh no that should be this one right sorry um there we go i think this is right okay so okay. now you see it thank you um so so the uh, i was saying the gandhi must fall movement is I, I was a economic movement as well as an intellectual movement and what i mean by this is that um the resistance was not simply to the gandhi statue but the idea that the indian government would present this gift um, and it be imposed on students and faculty and other community members of the University of Ghana without discussion, um, but also proximate to the presentation of this gift was the Indian government's financing of the rebuilding of the presidential palace, um, of the Ghanaian presidential palace in Accra, um, and broadening out from Accra on the continent of Africa, another uh, serious situation, which you also had a reading um, uh, recommended about in South Africa with this uh, business, these, these brothers, the Gupta brothers who had, uh, it had come to light um, in 2016, by 2016, the level of corruption that in which they had engaged to capture, quote unquote, to engage in state capture of the South African government, which was so shocking to South Africans because this was the African National Congress government, which had um, really been so instrumental in, in the downfall of apartheid and the, the, elect, the first free elections in South Africa. So, so Gandhi Must Fall was portrayed from the outside in very simplistic ways um, as being about this resistance to Gandhi. But I think you can see in the way that I've laid out all of the things that were happening that this was an economic uh, an economic boycott um but also as you read uh, one of the chief architects of the gandhi must fall movement uh obadali kanban professor obadali kanban also asked or said that a better statue from india to ghana would be a statue of bs ambedkar who i'll talk about in the talk who was the dalit leader the so-called untouchable leader who was a very active prominent political leader of the, the, the untouchable caste um, in India during the nationalist era, during the foundation of the, of the modern nation of India in 1947. So Kanban saying, why, why can't we have a statue of Ambedkar raises this really significant question. Could Ambedkar ever be the national symbol for India? Why is it Gandhi? Why is it not uh, a, 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 a different leader? So I would argue that there's also this, this intellectual dissent being expressed in this Gandhi Must Fall movement um, about decolonizing history and, and challenging Gandhi is a part of decolonizing history. So in 2018, the statue was brought down and that's what you see depicted here after, after these protests. Um, so, Interestingly, after Gandhi protests in on the African continent, there were others in Malawi and other countries. There have also been Gandhi protests in India, though they get less covered. Um, but there are groups in India who 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 
challenge his um, kind of dominance of Indian nationalist historiography. But in 2020, during the Black Lives Matter protests um, in the US and in the UK, Gandhi statues were also the site of protest. And you see here from the UK, um, in London, the top left, um, they, they decided to cover this Gandhi statue. Uh, the government decided to because, uh, because in Leicester, if you look at the other two pictures, in Leicester, um, the, the, his statue had been defaced. And in fact, in the bottom left-hand corner, you see um, in Leicester, the Indian descended community, some of them um, sort of guarding the statue because there had been these Black Lives Matter protests that led to these defacements. Um, so what I want to highlight in this is a couple of things in this image, in these set of images. One is that the, you know, the Black Lives Matter protests, of course, as we know, come from a longer tradition of protests. And you can see one of these invisible threads is this resistance to Gandhi. Um, a second point is that there is um, this idea for the British mind that protecting the Gandhi statue, the British governmental mind, protecting the Gandhi statue is protecting its own history in some way that Gandhi as you know, the preeminent figure of the father of India or the, one of the, the architects of the Indian nation um, symbolizes Britain's own sort of withdrawal from India. And, and he, he is a figure, a global figure, because he's acceptable in some ways that other, other leaders are not. Um, and, and of course his impact on the world was momentous, particularly in articulating Satyagraha, um, you know, nonviolent resistance and making it real. Um, but it's also significant that um, he looms large over other, other figures in history who different pockets of people would like to know more about or may, may um, admire more. Um, and finally, you can see that as the, in the way that the Gandhi statue has been protected by a group of people of South Asian descent in the picture on the left-hand side, that this seems to set up this tension between Black Lives Matter protesters and members of the South Asian community or people who are identified as sort of wanting to protect Gandhi's legacy. Um, so this is why I think, you know, this history or this question was Gandhi racist really deserves a far richer exploration than dismissing it as um, not an appropriate question to ask. So I want to present now some of the broader patterns and, and ideas that I want to draw out in, in this in our discussion. Um, the first is that um, race is a productive concept through which to explore African Indian relations, global history. And the reason I'm saying this is if you start reading enough about race outside of America and Europe, there is a automatic reaction that scholars, observers, people in every, you know, in everyday life say race is an imposition from America to the rest of the world. Race is a Euro-American construct that doesn't work in Asia or that doesn't, um, that doesn't apply to us. And um, um, uh, I'll, yes, I'll get to your question, Natalie. Yes, yeah, the race doesn't, I've, I recently had a presentation in my own class from about, uh, somebody who was talking about Brazil. Brazil In Brazil, there's a long narrative that race is, race is something that we don't have, we don't call it that in this country. Uh, it doesn't work like how it works in the United States. Um, and so I think it's productive to actually let's bring in race into this relationship, the African Asian relationship, and see if it's if it is useful, when it's useful, and when it's not useful. And in fact, one of the points that I try to make in my work is that Africans and Indians themselves have used the word race to discuss their relationships and also the way Europeans have seen them. So race is present in the modern world and we can't ignore it. Um, just to add this question, do I mean that in the way that colonizers have, colonizers have deemed Gandhi to be more acceptable revolutionary? I would argue that he has um, in part because of some of the history writing around Gandhi that takes away some of the, or de-emphasizes some of the other aspects of his personality and his, and his very pragmatic 
and 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 sometimes problematic life. I think um, you had, or I think you had referred to his gender politics, um, his his caste politics, and which does not take away from his other uh, accomplishments, right? But the way in which history has been written is about is about heroization, right? Mythologization. And we can talk more about this. Um, the second point that I want to make here, and this sort of relates to Gandhi, with the, the the very points that Gandhi raises, is that African Asian history is about race, reckoning with race is is intersectional. So race is not only skin color, um, but and if we take a textbook definition of race is you know biological essentialized differences. Um, that are often described as immutable, right? Um, or descent, or they, they pass through descent. This intersects very clearly, this idea of race intersects very clearly with caste, um, which we need a definition of. And, and more and more people are talking now about America as having a, ca a caste system, a racial caste system. Class, race, uh, caste is about occupation. Um, you are born into an endogamous, occupational caste, which means that you marry within your caste and it's defined by occupation. Uh, race has, as we know, has mapped onto um, occupations in the United States or in Europe and, uh, and or Brazil or other, other places. Class, um, mapping onto occupation. Um, genealogy, birth, origins, your blood. This is a very important idea in caste identity, for example, because it is about who you marry and have children with, um, and gender and sexuality, which relates to who you marry and who you have children with and how you uh, carry your line in the world and who you are descended from. Um, and your identity in the world, right? So a hyper-masculine sort of, uh, hyper-masculine expression of, um, of racial identity versus one in which gender is more fluid. And in fact, one of the more interesting analyses about Gandhi is the way in which, of course, he uh, used women, um, but also the way in which he projected a certain kind of gender identity um, as, a, as a Hindu man. So my larger point here is that um, uh, race is intersectional, right? And I think more and more studies have moved towards this idea that we don't look at race in isolation from other systems of power and other identifiers and, and, and self-identification, but also uh, identification by the outside um, systems of exclusion and inclusion. My third point is Afro-Asian solidarity, which, um, you know, is this narrative that arises particularly after 1955 when there was a meeting in um, Bandung, Indonesia, where 29 African and Asian countries representatives met um, to kind of forge a path uh, as post-colonial countries, um, or we could maybe talk about third world movements or the global south today. The idea of solidarity between in, in that in this world that's non-European and American and non-developed uh, nations has papered over conflicts of real consequences. So in other words, that the, the Ghanaians should accept this statue is a given because they have a special relationship and that relationship is distinct from Ghana's relationship with Britain, its former colonizer. The, the, that narrative has made it difficult for a, a, a real conversation about tensions and conflicts. Just like in South Africa, uh, you know, the multiracial anti-apartheid movement has made it difficult to, for, 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 well, it, well, one, it made it possible for the Guptas to actually come into South Africa and say, we're coming as friends. Uh, but then it's also really made tensions rise that have become, it's harder to express them. It's confusing. Do we see, do we do black South Africans see Indians in the same way as they see, you know, the Afrikaners? And in the article uh, in the New Yorker, you know, I think there's a quote where where some workers at the mine say, you know, the the white the white overseers at the mine or the white bosses at the mine are actually better than these Indian bosses. And so there's this comparison. Um, because it's so difficult to express what these relationships should look like or should be in idealized ways, but in real everyday ways. 
um, as you can see in real situations like working in a mine. Um, and the fourth, the struggle against anti-blackness is an intellectual struggle. Um, how we recount history is, is a, is, should be scrutinized and brought under the microscope. So why are gone, this goes back to Natalie's question, why are gone the Mandela MLK worthy of global recognition while other leaders like B.S. Ambedkar, um, Malcolm X and others are not representative of good trouble, right? Malcolm X is uh, still a representative of ambivalent trouble, right? So, and, and Ambedkar, um, what he proposed in challenging Hinduism and Hindu casteism in particular by promoting you know, conversion of Dalits to Buddhism um, and other kinds of reforms, he, he really challenged what it meant to be Indian, which was really what was on the table in articulating the Indian nation. So these are some of the, the, the wider parts. Sorry, I just had an avalanche. Oh, these are some of the wider patterns and ideas that I, I, I want to draw out of what I'm going to deliver, talk about in terms of more detailed uh, illustrations for the rest of the talk. Um, so one important point of history, I think, is to highlight, and probably many of you teach about this, that there is an African diaspora in South Asia. Um, and the African diaspora in South Asia is a fascinating history that we are only now coming to learn more about um, that we, we, this could stretch back as old as 1200 years ago, the arrival of Africans in the South Asian subcontinent um, and the Mediterranean world in Iran, even into further East in Asia. Um, historians estimate that between 800 and 1900 AD or CE, about 12, slaves from the African continent went east, not into the Atlantic world. Now, this is not a good number because that number is basically exactly the same that's estimated for the transatlantic slave trade. And these are historians working from, you know, less good records because they weren't modern records kept on ships, census records like you find that the Europeans kept on the transatlantic slave voyages. Um, so this is an estimate of the various slave trades, but the, it's important to emphasize that all the Africans who came to South Asia, to India, um, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, you know, what was greater, what was India then, um, was, uh, they were not all slaves. Some of them were uh, sold, uh, sorry, sailors, uh, pirates, um, traders, but a lot of them were slaves. And as you can see from the second bullet point, these slaves uh, were, when you think of a kind of old world slavery, many of them were soldiers, domestic servants, concubines. Um, and in the Indian context, some of these Africans rose to great prominence. They became generals and chiefs in, in armies in the Deccan Plateau, um, in Gujarat region. Um, and I was a uh, one, particular person who stands out in history, Malik Umbar, was one of these slave soldiers who becomes a very, uh, you know, a royal family. Um, you know, he, he, it emerges that he has his own royal family. And, you know, these, if they're large, they're, many of them are men. They, most of them, probably a large percentage of these slaves, and they marry Indian women. And the descendants of these communities are called Sidis or Hubshis. In India and in Pakistan, Shidis or Makrani. Um, Hubshi is a word that you might see, it, it might be familiar. It, um, it comes from an old term for Ethiopia, Habasha. Um, so a lot of the slaves were actually from Ethiopia as well. Now, can we associate Africans with blackness in South Asia? I think this is something it's difficult to answer. Um, blackness has many associations in India and they're different than in other parts of the world. Um, in Hinduism, uh, there are black gods and goddesses. Krishna um, is a black god. He's so black, he's blue. Uh, Kali is a goddess, a black goddess. Um, and in Islam, um, Bilal, uh, blackness is associate, black, blackness is not symbolic, but uh, black slave, an African slave, Bilal, 
was one of Muhammad's, the Prophet Muhammad's first um, companions, most, uh, most devout companions, and was the caller to prayer. Um, and in, um, in uh, Islam also, there are Sufi saints who are African descended. And in, in India, there, there's a fantastic a uh, set of research by, there's a scholar named Nilima J. Chandran who's written about African shrines to African Sufi saints on the Kerala coast, the West Indian coast. But was Africa associated with blackness? I think this is not clear. And if you read about what, was, what were the terms in India, what were the ideas in India that, ex that prefigured Europeans coming? There were definitely words in Vedic script, I mean, in Vedic scriptures about uh, barbarians or Vedic texts about barbarians, sort of like you find in Roman um, uh, sources. There were, there was uh, Jadi caste, Varna skin color, but blackness did not consign you to a particular, darker skin did not consign you to a particular caste or, uh, or level of society that there's no evidence for. And so this is why people say on the African continent, in the Indian subcontinent, there are ideas that, ex pre that, that were there before Europeans got there and they were ideas of exclusion and hierarchy and um, difference that then European ideas of hierarchy, difference and exclusion mapped onto. Um, and, and this is something that um, I think we can talk more about because it does, it means that race is a very multi-layered idea. This is why we don't say it's not race, but that race is composed of, of multiple strands and elements that come from different cultures. Um, just to give you an example of how for, you know, a great way, way to even depict the, the, the presence of Africans in India and Pakistan today, in a world history class, for example, um, and is is by looking um, at ethnographic studies of these communities. So this this these pictures are all relate to the Shidis in Pakistan, um, who today are a community um, in Lahore or around Lahore, who are the keepers of the shrine to a Sufi saint a peer named Mungo. Um, and you can see in the top from the colonial era that this image is. Um, uh, of an African descended person in Pakistan and or then India and Lahore um, at this shrine. Those are the dargahs or tombs that you see in the back um, where the a donkey um, is. And um, you see on the bottom, these crocodiles, there's a river bank and these crocodiles are there and there's an annual festival where uh, the Sufis sing, the, the shrine keepers sing and they are possessed and by the, the, the saint's spirit, and they are able to talk to and, and, and these, the crocodiles. Um, and so, and on the right bottom, you see a girl of the Shidi community. Um, so these are communities that have lived in South India, uh, sorry, in, in the South Asian uh, subcontinent for centuries. And how these African descended communities become incorporated into local society is largely through ritual means, being part, being part of Muslim culture, being a part of Hindu uh, a system. Basically, that after the abolition of slavery by the British in 1843, slaves were no longer technically a category. That was not a category. And these people as relative newcomers into South Asia didn't have a caste per se, right? They didn't have a historical root, um, even though they might've been there for centuries. And especially in Islam, you're not supposed to really technically have caste, but many Muslim in, in India in particular communities still use caste just like Christian communities. And it's a real point, point of, of, of contention. Um, so, one of the ways in which these Africans become so embedded into Asian society is through religion. Um, so how does this relate to, when we think about, there are about 3 million people today on the African continent who are descended from, from South Asia, Indians. And so you wonder what kinds of ideas did they come with? Forgetting about the fact that the British are the um, you know, the colonial masters for many decades, almost a century in Africa and in 
India itself for more than a century, for several centuries. What, what, what did Gandhi, for example, believe about Africans when he came to live in South Africa? He came in 1893, it was supposed to be a short stay. He stayed for 21 years. He came as an attorney, uh, a lawyer to represent the Indian trading community in South Africa. He, he did not initially come to represent the indentured workers. Um, some of you had mentioned the indentured, the indentured people who had come um, on labor contracts to South Africa. Um, he came to represent the passenger class of Indians who were you know, largely from his part of India, Gujarat, who um, were trading people and they were, their rights were being denied. Um, what did he think? Well, we don't know. Um, about what he knew from his experience growing up in Gujarat, although not only 20 kilometers, I think it is from where he, his village, where he grew up, Porbandar, uh, was one of these CD shrines. Um, but we do know that when he was asked directly with, or, or confronted directly in South Africa with the question, you know, of Africans and uh, Africans and Indians having a common purpose or a common uh, representate wanting to have a common representation to the British colonial authorities, he wrote in in 1893 that the Indians are, share a a racial commonality with with the English. The, so they we're from a common stock, he says, called the Indo Aryan, and this is quoted in a book that by um, Ashwin Desa and Ghulam Vahid that was published in 2015 that really became very explosive in India um, and in Africa, in like in Ghana, for example, it's a very widely read book about Gandhi's racism in South Africa. So he was really stressing, we are Aryans, and he and he says in other passages and other writings that Africans are not ready for self-government, they're not ready for the kind of government that Indians are even ready for because they are racially different. Other ways he stressed the difference between Indians and Africans. He said he thought of Africans as Christians. They had their own priests and Indians are Hindus are Muslims and they're essentially different. Um, and you and given what I've said about the importance of course to, to Indians in a religious worldview, the idea of Christianity in India for Hindus is also very alien. Um, in fact, it's looked at, looked down upon. It's fascinating to me as somebody who studies, um, who stu my first research was on Christian missionaries in, in, in colonial Nigeria. Um, you know, missionaries had an enormous presence and impact on the African continent and they were present in, in India, but there was a huge resistance to missionaries such that even today in India, when you get a visa to go for, to, to, um, to India, you have to, there's a mis specific missionary visa um, that they want to know that if that's what you're doing. Um, so, so how much did Gandhi's views be shaped by older forms, newer forms, or not even Gandhi, but thinking about the hundreds and hundreds, tens of thousands of Indians who began migrating um, to, from India to the African continent, to East Africa, and eventually even to West Africa as business people, as what uh, some scholars call sub-colonialists or intermediary colonialists. What did they think about Africans? Well, we can, we, we can, we can say that they had older ideas about caste um, and about blackness. Um, although not blackness in the same way because skin color had a different resonance um, or didn't consign you, as I had said, to an automatic unequal position. Um, but that these categories also become shaped by European colonialism. Um, so Aryan, Dravidian. Aryan, uh, obviously by World War II has a very, um, ex you know, violent, expression um, by the Germans, but Aryan was a term that was an ethno-linguistic term like Dravidian for the South Indian um, Indians. These were ethno-linguistic terms that were conflated into racial terms. This is very similar to what the British did in, in parts of Africa with the Hamitic myth um, and in Nigeria, for example, but the Belgians, the Germans and the Belgians did in Rwanda and, Ethi and, and in Ethiopia. Um, the the uh, it, even though the Ethiopia was only colonized for a very short period, 
by the Italians, the idea of there were races within in African populations that were Hamitic. They were descended from uh, Ham in the Bible. Um, so a European or quasi Europe, uh, closer to European stock. Um, and these races were favored in the colonial system. So um, I can talk a lot more about this because it really has been studied much more now since the Rwandan genocide, since um, uh, uh, right, you know, religious, almost racial problems in Nigeria. But people have begun to ask um, about how older categories of difference in societies that were colonized by European countries how these exclusions were and these these hierarchies were made into racialized categories over the colonial period. As I say in the second point, the British favored the martial races. They favored these sort of uh, races that were seen to be militarily superior, taller, uh, physically taller, like the Tutsi in, in like the Belgians favored the Tutsi in in Rwanda, um, uh, and and then skin color as well because the uh, the idea was that there was these lighter skinned people among Asians and Africans were more closely related to Europeans. Now the other side of this is in the 20th century in these colonized territories and in India in particular um, blackness becomes embraced by some groups of people uh, because as an identity of um, being victimized. Uh, I, I'm gonna go into more examples of this, but Muslims in India as a discriminated minority by the Hindu majority um, and uh, fighters against caste, against, against the Brahmin high caste control, um, Hindus, um, and including in South India, for example, so-called Dravidian movement in South India where uh, the Dravidians in Tamil Nadu in particular said they were the indigenous people of India before the Aryan invasion and Christian Indians also identified as, you know, coming from the lowest caste, coming from the indigenous people and they were in, and the Christians were influenced by African experiences. So there was this embrace of blackness. So a further racialization um, is what I want to emphasize. So even in Rwanda, for example, the, the Hutu really sees the identity that the Hutu who were, were there, where are there, were invaders and they were uh, discriminated and oppressed before the colonial period, which is also a narrative that the Belgians had used to say that they should rule with the Tutsi and through the Tutsi over the Hutus. So in, in effect, what I'm trying to emphasize is that older ideas become manipulated and distorted for the use of the colonial powers, but also for resistance. Um, okay, how, I, just to give a couple of examples um, from how this idea of Indians being Aryan, how it plays out around the world. Um, in America, um, two very contrasting cases. Um, in 1917, um, there's a case of an Indian migrant to the United States, Bhagat Thind Singh, who wants to challenge, or he wants to become a citizen. And the US government had passed the, Ant the Asian Exclusion Act in which they had wanted to bar all immigration from Asia, except from Japan. But in the course of the debates, they decided to open up in 1917, the, um, the legal citizenship for Indians on the argument that they were Aryans. In 1923, a man named Bhagat Thin Singh in Oregon um, it was, was denied his citizenship and he brings his suit to, before the Supreme Court and says that he should be made a citizen because he's white. Um, and the Supreme Court at that time decides that Indians are not whites. They are not, they are not related by blood, by genealogy to European Aryans. Now, you see here that there's this Indian claim to being white. Um, but on the other hand, there are Indians in North America in the United States, like um, H. Mudgal, um, who was we, born in India, maybe by way of Trinidad, comes to the United States, 
But the interesting thing about him is he becomes the editor for Marcus Garvey's newspaper, one of Marcus Garvey's newspapers, The Negro World, um, in which he really is a black activist. He's a black nationalist in a lot of ways, an so early black nationalist. And he argues with Indians and says, you should not be claiming that you're white um, because uh, he doesn't deny that our Indians might be Aryans, but he says that this is a mythical racial term that the Europeans and whites have been playing with and that Indians claiming to be Aryans were victims of white propaganda. So here you have very different and interesting uh, reverberations, I would say, of these racial ideologies around the world. And in particular, this these, these ongoing constructions of what blackness is and what whiteness is and what brownness is in relation to blackness and whiteness. Um, now there's also a, a contrasting with Gandhi. Um, other sympathies, Du Bois, you see on the left side, very important black intellectual, um, pan-Africanist who didn't know B.S. Ambedkar well, but in 1946, we have evidence that they, we have letters that they exchanged expressing sympathy of the, for the, between the black cause and the Dalit cause. Um, and later there, it, uh, during the era of the Black Panthers, there's an organization that f gets formed in India called the Dalit Panthers that really specifically identifies um, Dalits in India with, with the Black Panthers, with blackness. But so in other words, there are alternatives to Gandhi. Um, I should also mention that by 1946, Gandhi's you know, reputation is very sealed, right? As this is the Mahatma. And um, there have been black leaders from America like Howard Thurman who, go, who goes, he's a Christian uh, African-American leader who makes a pilgrimage to India um, with several other Christian, black Christians and it's organized by an Indian Christian. And one of the Americans is, you know, said, is told by an Indian says, oh, these are he taken to a Dalit community and said, you're an untouchable. And that at first the African-American says, thinks I'm not. And then he writes about how, you know, he has this awakening. Yes, in America, he is, a, he's also an untouchable. Um, so in other words, you know, several of you raised the problem. So how do you teach about Gandhi, right? I think one of the one very effective way to teach about Gandhi is to teach around Gandhi. So what else was happening? Who else was it was 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 living and you know agitating and expressing views about race and resistance? Well, these are some of the other actors. And and this is why I argue that Ghanaians were saying we need to have different kinds of histories. We don't need we don't need the um, the singular sort of history of, of India in Africa being told through Gandhi or African Indian relations, black Indian relations being told through Gandhi. Now, the rest of my talk, I wanna go through other uh, ways of, of, of going beyond Gandhi. And this is, these are all, I developed better in my book. So I just wanna give you a taste of other ways in which um, specifically African and Indian cultural brokers work on projects to confront race very directly or, 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 or think about race identity um, uh, intersectionality in, in different ways. So the first is religious hybridities and I'm here specifically gonna give an example from indigenous African religion but African diaspora religion, Mami Wata, uh, in which Indian icons, Hindu icons and images get incorporated. Um, and particularly in this very gender, uh, fl well, fluid, but also um, uh, power, that gender fluidity, that, that these figures have power and harnessing these hybridities between Indians and black and black and African, and black Indian and African, uh, deities is a way of harnessing power, good fortune in a spiritual way. The second is the Ahmadiyya movement in Islam. Islam it has this, this particular sect of, of Islam, but Islamic texts in general have a very clear message about the equality of, of all races and people. And this movement in starting in the early 1900s takes this idea into a very clear direction of anti-racism. 
Uh, a third third project I want to highlight is uh, Senghor's Negr uh, Leopold Senghor, the president of first president of Senegal, who embraces this African connection to South India, to what he calls you know sort of Black India, uh, an Afro Dravidian project that he begins in universities in Senegal and in India in the 1970s. And then I want to end with an example from Ghanaian Hinduism. I know I'm going to be um, maybe going a little bit over my time. So this is just an image of Mamiwata icons, uh, you know, paintings in from from different African painters, um, particularly in the coastal West Africa. So Togo, Nigeria, um, Ghana, where there has been over over a, more than 100 years um, visual symbology of of, of incorporating into this water deity. Mami Wata is a water de deity. She is, you know, depicted as a half fish, half human, or a half snake, half human, or a half uh, a mermaid. Um, and Hindu images have been incorporated into Mami Wata worship for at least a century, if not more. And um, it's a very powerful image in part, the set of images in part, because it also really does keep alive indigenous African religions. And so Hinduism is seen as a, as a, as a kind of, um, in this way, not in a, a devoid of caste, devoid of uh, the associations that we sort of typically think of Hinduism, but in this sense, in a way to merge human um, human animal forms, right? Non-human non animals and human animals, but really to think about the power of indigenous religions. And it's hard for me in a short time to emphasize how important this preservation of indigenous religions is because Christianity and Islam have so vilified indigenous religions in Africa where many people have to practice Mamiwata in secret. So India serves, Indian images kind of serve that preservation purpose. Um, my second example is about the Hamadiyya, which who have a fascinating history. This sect was founded in Punjab in, the, in 1889 um, in a rural area of India in Punjab, um, but they become a worldwide missionary movement. What you see on the left side is a um, Hamadi Punjabi um, missionary meeting the chief of Lagos, um, Olua, in London in 1929. And this begins a very intense connection between West Africans and um, these Ahmadi um, missionaries. And so, in fact, you have Muslim Indian missionaries going from India to actually they come to America. They're very active in Black communities in America, Detroit, um, Chicago, even smaller cities in the United States. And they also become active in West Africa. And on the right side, you see Ghanaian Hamadi com community gathered in 1974 to welcome a Pakistani Hamadiya. I can talk more about the Ahmadiyya uh, because they, they've also been, they themselves have been very discriminated against. But what I want to emphasize is that the Ahmadis influenced by their experience in African-American communities and the, their experiences in West Africa uh, really pick up this idea of Pan-Africanism and um, Afrocentrism, I guess you could call it, from Africans and African-Americans and bring it into Pan-Islamism. In 1927, this is a quote from an article in a Punjabi uh, a, a, a newspaper in Lahore. Um, and I'll just read a little bit of it. Malik Kafur, who as history tells us, fell in love with a blue-eyed, fair-complexioned princess of the imperial harem, hailed from the rank of low-class Hindu. The general who commanded the Patan army during the days of Sultan Razia was no other than a black Abyssinian. The first general who led the Muslim army into the land of the Nile was no other than a black Othello. The first Muezzin of Islam, um, Bilal was a slave, a Negro. In India, we find a dynasty is known by the proud title of slave dynasty came as they were from the status of slaves. Um, in short, as we proceed through the pages of the Islamic history, the same example of equality and brotherhood will meet us in every page. This is the complete merging of Pan-Africanism, Afrocentrism and Pan-Islamism, that Islam is the, the best religion 
in the world because of its anti, you know, its non-racialism or anti-racism. But what this is really doing, if you think about right, this being written in India in 1927, is it's really a, Hin a Muslim challenge to Hindu supremacy. You can see the idea of, um, it, the, the quote actually goes on where the author talks about um, Muslims in India being drawn from the lowest castes of, of Hindu society. Um, and other interesting points, um, some of uh, these, these Hamidi missionaries become really important for India and Pakistan after independence in 1947 to forge relationships with West African countries. And you see on the right side, one of these Indian missionaries who was a journalist in Nigeria and lived there for decades, welcoming Muhammad Ali uh, when he came to Nigeria and presenting him with a Quran in um, 1964. So these, these Muslim Indians really become embedded in the fabric of Pan-Africanism and, and, and Pan-Islamism um, and within African societies, as you can see, as being sort of an ambassador even to of new African governments to, to the rest of the world. Um, now, the third example that I wanted to give was about Leopold Senghor, who is one of the architects or fathers of the idea of, of the whole school of literature and philosophy, Negritude, the French Pan-Africanist vision or French equivalent, Francophone equivalent. Um, and he forms, Senghor is president of, poet president of Senegal. He forms a close relationship with the head of the UNESCO from 1950, Malcolm Adi Seshaya, who is a Indian Christian, a South Indian Christian. And Senghor really begins to be, well, he always was fascinated because of his studies in Paris in, um, in ancient history uh, with, with this idea of the land bridge between Africa and India, this fabled Lemuria was one of the ideas uh, that, you know, Madagascar was this, at one time the continents were connected. Um, and so he's also influenced by Sheikh Anchad Diop, who, who was his rival, rival, who was one of the fathers of, of Afrocentrism as like an intellectual school in, in Senegal. And so the two of them also discuss the fact that many African students don't even want to come to India to study because of, the, of what they perceive as racism in India and among Indians. So uh, through several relationships, I mean, the Indian embassy is started in Dakar in 1962, but in 1974, Senghor and Indira Gandhi form a, a formal, create a formal collaboration between at University of Dakar and Anamale University in Tamil Nadu, or what's now Tamil Nadu, um, um, in, and to, at the university to have a department of Afro-Indian studies, which was specifically to study these ancient connections, possibly even ancient uh, kind of um, racial, linguistic, uh, civilizational contacts. And this led to Indian scholars coming to India, I mean, to Senegal and Senegalese scholars going to India. And here you can see this Indian woman linguist um, who uh, uh, was receiving an award from Senghor. I, she had passed away by the time I was able to do this research and I, and I met her husband, um, who was also a, a linguist and they both went to Senegal. So this was another way to rewrite the history of race in an Afro-Indian um, frame and, and really to teach it in African and Indian universities. I mean, that's what is, I think is really remarkable is the idea that post-colonial countries wanted, you know, with intellectuals like Senghor wanted to reframe the entire understanding and their educational system around race. Um, even if those categories were touched by European colonialism, like the category of Dravidian itself. Um, so my final example is from Ghanaian Hinduism, which many people don't think Africans would become Hindus. 
and there's a lot of reasons why people wouldn't think that. Um, but this is the story of uh, the first African Hindu monk who was initiated in 1974. You see him here with this teacher who initiated him. Um, he was born into an, a family that the, his mother was a priestess of, of indigenous African religion, um, Akan religion, and she was a priestess to the local chief. She died, his father was an herbalist. He becomes very interested in meditation and other kinds of kind of spiritual forms. And he gets a recommendation from um, a, a, a Ghanaian man who had been a soldier in, Afri in India. During World War II, hundreds of thousands of African soldiers served in the British and French armies. And in the British case, they were stationed in Burma um, and other parts of India. And so India gets this reputation for having these religious, you know, these ashrams. And so Kwesi Essel goes, he comes back to Ghana and he has a circle of disciples who include Indian people of the Indian diaspora as well as Africans. And I think it's very remarkable that in, he, you know, there are Indians who come to him as a religious teacher, as a guru. Um, and he begins in 1974, the head of, he becomes the head of the Hindu monastery of Africa. Um, then actually on the right side here, you see there's a there's a Ugandan um, Buddhist monk who I just recently read about, um, who started as a student in Africa. I mean, I'm sorry, a student in India. He was a university student and he began studying religion and then eventually he uh, studied Buddhism and became, um, you know, a guru, a teacher. Um, so what I want to just quickly go through is that Swami Gananda, the, the Ghanaian Swami, writes this article in a magazine that's meant for the Hindu, worldwide Hindu diaspora, so which is millions of people. India has the largest diaspora in the world, arguably the modern world, this is what the, w, uh, the um, World Bank estimates. Um, and what's fascinating is that Swami Gananda uses his authority, which as I've said, he has Indian and African disciples, to, and if you can read this longer quote, or I can make it available, my presentation available, he says, um, you know, Africans didn't know about, in, about Hinduism. The few Indians who arrived were merchants and workers were interested purely in their businesses, not in portraying Hindu lifestyle. Um, and, and then he goes on to say, um, uh, the Indian community mixes little with other Africans. They tend to be inward looking and share only with Indians rather than sharing the best things about Hinduism with Africans. As a result, Hinduism has a very low profile in Africa today. So what I find really fascinating is that he's challenging the idea of racial separation and, 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 and the merchant classes who, of Indians who came to, to um, Africa as the initial people initial Indians who came to the African continent over several centuries, which, which you know, I sort of laid out at the beginning with, with Gandhi, but, you know, there's a broader history there. But what's very interesting is that there, he makes this moral argument about why that's a problem, um, that, that Indians have not shared their religion, and that he also talks about in that quote, African religion being very similar, African indigenous religions being very similar to Indian religion, to Hinduism. So, so to make sure that I can leave some time, I want to um, just go to my conclusions. Um, Gandhi was an important historical figure, but we can study the man in relation to others and the methods apart from the man. I think this, you know, I've tried to lay out this cast of characters that really, I hope, decenters Gandhi a little bit, but also his ideas. I mean, he's not the inventor of, of nonviolence. And if you go, the Ahmadis talked about nonviolence. Uh, there were Black leaders talking about nonviolence. And nonviolence was a very contested issue. Um, the ANC, the African National Congress in South Africa was debating it, you know, from the 1930s. And so, you know, he, 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 was, he was a very pragmatic and skillful political leader. And um, uh, uh, Faisal Devji makes this point um, in his book called Impossible India. 
Um, African worldviews are complex and revealing. I've been, I argue that, you know, India sort of positions itself as the soul of the world. You know, Mahatma is the soul of India and Gandhi is this kind of soulful figure, but Africa really does become a conscience, particularly from India, if you trace this history, for India, if you trace this history out, in particularly, if you look at the contemporary uh, anti-Gandhi, Gandhi must fall, Africans are sort of saying to Indians how, how do you be? How do we behave in the world? How do we? How do we respect and and have a intellectual dialogue? Um, how do we? Um, how do we? How do we do things in the global south? And I think that's a very implicit, important, implicit question in the Gandhi Must Fall movement. Um, and then the last point: race is not a simple idea and requires nuanced perspectives. And unfortunately, maybe surprisingly, Africa gets left out of formulations of race. But as you can see. They're some of the uh, most complex multiracial situations around the world are already prefigured in Africa, in African countries because of the long history of migration of different kinds of people to the continent. Um, so I'm gonna end it there. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I hope that was useful um, and interesting. Um, I know that it's a lot of information. So um, I'm happy for us to discuss anything that you want to discuss in that or some other topic. Thank you so much. Let's have people jump right in with your little Zoom hands, if you would. And Shobana, as people are thinking a little, I, I would, since we now have your presentation, I'd be happy to go ahead and share it if that's okay with you. Definitely. And there's some of the links to some of those pictures and other stories are in the, the PowerPoint as well. Beautiful. Okay. Um, Parul, jump in. Hi, Shobna. Thanks so much for your presentation and for the readings you shared. Everything was really um, interesting and super stimulating. Um, one of the things that I've like been having, you know, like all these thoughts about was um, the argument put forward by Professor Kambon that there was like a sort of disconnect between Gandhi's writings in English and like what he was writing in Gujarati. And um, I was wondering if you could speak to that. I mean, I know that like, I, I, I totally see your point about teaching around him, but like my questions about him persist. And so I was wondering if you could speak to that. I mean, I, you know, I think it's a really good point because I think a lot of it is not, I don't know how much of it is translated. And this is the problem with also with world history, right? Is that there, there are, we, to really understand, we need the non-English, we need the non-English text. And I don't, I mean, uh, you know, since most of my work has been on in African history, I don't know that history as well. And, and, you know, to your point, I mean, I've been writing this book and I haven't found that. So it's not as if, I mean, I know that Ramachandra Guha, for example, has written this really, you know, multi-volume work on Gandhi's life, but not through the, see, the question that Kanban and his movement raised was summarily dismissed by Indian scholars. Nobody wanted to deal with it. What Guha said was, you know, he was racist as a young man and he grew out of it. And how many times have we heard that before, right? This person was racist when they were younger, but they grew out of it. That could be true, but what he was saying would be interesting and important, right? But nobody has actually wanted to put the frame of race onto those readings. And this is why these categories, I think, are worth discussing and race and caste. So if you look at the South Asian, you know, historians of South Asia will say, there is a relationship between race and caste. And, but, but that idea has been so unpopular in South Asian history that people won't follow that angle. Where is that something that people who work on African history do, if that, if that makes sense. And so I think you raise a really good question and I think it can only be answered by more people doing that work, but you have to respect each other's question, research questions to even do that work. Thank you. Um, I think, oh, Mark? Yeah, Mark. The, the, the thing that I sometimes struggle with is how do you separate out um, the idea that some of what he's espousing is 
political and his means to an end versus necessarily his actual views. And, you know, this goes to, you know, everything from religion to just, you know, to race, you know, because at the end of the day, he is trying to achieve a certain ends. And how do we separate that out from his true beliefs, you know, which, you know, I think I haven't really figured out how to do. I mean, I think you raise a really good point that to students we have to emphasize is that, you know, making, you know, being, making change is really, really difficult on a, on a it lived everyday scale and then on the scale of what he did. So, for example, when Ambedkar even went to him and said, we have to make caste reform, you know, a central part of the Indian nation, you know, not later on, but now, you know, not this is something we do gradually. And Gandhi said, no, 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 we can't, we can't do that because it will alienate all these people who we need, right? And so, so Ambedkar was never satisfied with that. But I think one of the, um, he, you know, he was a really good tactician and pragmatic, but, but I think one of the problems in the African case is that he, he really, he realized in South Africa that, I mean, South, apartheid was already being made in South Africa when he lived there. And he realized that he was not, I think he, he realized that he was, allying with Africans was gonna bring him nothing. And I think that is what's really sort of difficult and poisonous about this, coming out into light is that he, it, it wasn't going, I mean, even the, 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 who he allied with when he did become more racially sensitive and tolerant were African-Americans, right? It was not leaders in Africa who he, South Africa, the, the South African anti-apartheid movement was, well, anti-apartheid, apartheid was official in 1948, but it was starting. So, I mean, I think there's been a tendency to dismiss Africans you know, in history and the importance of Africa for a very long time. And so I think, I mean, I think Gandhi is guilty of that. And I don't think he's the only one who's guilty of that. I mean, I think, I think that's, I think that's the problem. And so I think what you ask is a really hard question. Um, but I think one of the answers is that, um, you know, he, he, he didn't, he didn't think a lot of people discount Africa. And I think we have to unpack why we discount Africa. You know, even black, African-American struggles are seen as more important than African struggles. But I think African-Americans see, to non-African-Americans, but I think African-Americans, especially, you know, at different moments have seen their struggle very connected to African struggles. Mm -hmm. And Pan-Africanism has influenced, you know, non-Africans but whether they acknowledge that or not is another question.